Hey everyone, today I am in a coffee shop talking with Dr. Scott Spritigliozzi from the office and we go over a, a few really important concepts. One is putting under the microscope the utility of mold testing and mold binding treatment. It's something that we're using but we're kind of cautiously exploring how do we best use this therapy and really trying to look at what we're doing and filter out where are we doing things right and where might we have room for improvement. We also talk about the importance of exercise and how exercise can help reflexively help with worry and obsessive compulsive thinking about your health and your diet and how this may be one of the tools that leads to other benefits spurring off of that. Um, and then additionally, we share uh, two case studies actually on GI health, one for whom prebiotics was causing weeks and weeks and weeks of diarrhea and finally, just asking the question of, have you tried stopping your prebiotic actually resolved the, the, uh, the diarrhea? And we tie that in with the meta-analysis showing that while prebiotics can improve bifidobacterium levels, yes, this systematic review with meta-analysis did not find any improvement in symptoms. And when you juxtapose that with the finding that the adverse events in prebiotic interventional trials is somewhat high, it starts to sketch out a story of considering prebiotics, but being careful not to use them without considering if they may be flaring some of your symptoms. So just a really, in my opinion, chock full discussion of clinical pearls with Dr. Scott. And now we will head over to the conversation with him. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm here with Dr. Scott. We are both committing a sin of videography, which I'm learning you never want to wear white because it's too reflective. So apologies for we that. Sorry. But uh, learning from Huberman and the black or dark shirt. But, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to discuss today was this constant role I find myself in, which is questioning if what we're doing in the clinic is actually working. And I was joking to you, I feel like part of my responsibility is to be the clinic jerk and periodically be like, does any of this shit work? <laughs> right? And that's truly what I find myself saying periodically about anything and everything that we do. This is why there are many things that we've been slow or minimal to adopt. Let's say low oxalate, low salicylate, just haven't really found a high success rate with those. In GI, the signal has been so clear, so consistent, not 100%, but you're at least looking at a irrefutable signal of benefit from most of the GI therapies. The area that I still question, open but um, tenuous, is regarding mold. And I've learned from Joe's case, I've learned from your case, I've learned from my case, but it's your case that we were discussing that I wanted to unpack a little bit more because as I've been the jerk of the clinic and repeatedly asking myself, are these things really working or working as effectively as we think they are? Or could there be confirmation bias? Could there be other variables that are leading to the, the benefit that we're seeing? There's a few things in your case that make me wonder if it wasn't actually mold and, and if maybe it was a bit presumptive to make that conclusion. And so, do you want to set the stage in terms of what was happening? I'll, I'll put up one or two points, but one of the things that I thought was odd was how quickly you responded to binders. It just seemed to be uncharacteristic of mold detoxification therapy to see a quick response. Now, we can unpack the details here, but that was the one thing that roused my suspicion because you made the you know the comment that you had pivoted to mold with Joe and then very quickly after that you were kind of done and it just seemed too fast for the mm -hmm. typical kind of response arc that you'll see in mold or at least as it's purported to be so that got me thinking and then you know you're here for the weekend hanging out we're talking about things obviously all things health right but um as we unpack this a little bit more i'm wondering if it is actually bile sequestration or bile binding from the detox agents that led you 
quick resolution of GI symptoms mm -hmm. and some of the other uh, extra intestinal manifestations of GI upset that we can see, like fatigue and brain fog improve. All right, sorry guys, we got kicked out of our previous location, Colton House. Shame on you guys for <laughs> requiring a week notice. Um, so we're framing the issue of the response curve seem to be too fast for it to be mold. And as we're always questioning if what we're doing is working or as effective as it could be, we have to periodically put our therapies under the microscope. And you were saying on the carpet over here, you know, is it a bad idea to question these things? Might patients who are taking binders think it's the wrong thing to do? Maybe, right? We have to be willing to tolerate the fact that we're not doing everything perfectly if we're going to be able to get better. So if you're someone on binders or thinking about doing binding therapy, this is one of the things that we're questioning. And we have to question everything in order to figure out what works, what works the best, what should we use, what should we not use. So with that on the table, take us through and kind of remind the audience of the, the framing of your case. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go specifically into kind of what changed with the binders, the timeline, and sort of pick some of that apart so people can help to hopefully learn from that as to be able to conclude if their binding therapy is needed or future therapy may or may not be needed. Yeah, absolutely. So when I first came to the clinic, I was having you know gut issues, gut symptoms, um, and I had come to the clinic to you know get help since I've done a lot of different things and they weren't working. Um, what I had done at the clinic was I you know did probiotics, did uh, you know different. Let's start, sorry, let's start with your symptoms. What symptoms. Were your, what were your symptoms yeah. at baseline? Symptoms were so looser stool, brain fog after eating. Uh, fatigue, and those are pretty much the, the big three for me. Um, okay. And so, in terms of my history, I, I had mold exposure a couple of years ago living uh, living at home. There was water damage, so I had the exposure. Uh, I had gone through uh, you know months of probiotics, months of herbal antimicrobials, and just didn't lead to improvement in. Sorry, coming back my, to the coming back to the exposure. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that your symptoms started or clearly got worse? when you had the exposure or did you notice that when you were in or out of that environment things got better or worse there was a clear uh, uh, i wasn't maybe not super clear but what happened was i was also you know starting my own business at the time so there was a lot of stress plus the fact that there was the water damage so there was two there's two confounding variables there was a clear trend in that i definitely got worse during that period of time um and i lived there for a year and a half so just didn't really think much of it because i was you know doing other things and wasn't focusing on my health as much. Uh, but once I was focusing on my health, then I you know, tried all these different things, uh, probiotics, like I said, herbal antimicrobials, and then nothing, nothing improved in terms of my gut symptoms, my brain fog. And then what we had done was, actually, I had left where, my, you know, where I'm currently living, left for a weekend, and I realized, oh, my, my gut symptoms are better. I'm eating whatever I want. I'm not reacting to food. Uh, my you know, bowel movements are great, and I'm not taking any supplements at all. And so I told my doctor that, shout out to Dr. Joe, and I uh, told him that, and he said, okay, well, maybe it's uh, something in your environment. So given my history of mold exposure, we did a real-time lab. And you were, sorry, you were still in that original environment, or you had since moved? I had since moved to a, uh, an apartment in uh, Washington State, so moved from New York to Washington. And, and the so symptoms... Got better after moving, or they no, were they similar? they were still the same. Um, okay. But I also had noticed like mold in those apartments as well. Um, now is this just mold on the windowsill? Because I think that's really important to clarify that I would not classify mold on the outside or maybe the inside border of mm. the windowsill as being the same as what I had, which was visible evidence of mold in the HVAC mm. in multiple places. Right. So I think we have to be really, not to not to be too scrupulous, but I think yeah. we have to really be careful not to just say mold. Like, and I've sure. had some patients who said, well, there's mold. Well, where's the mold? Well, the, the bathroom curtain sometimes gets mold and then mm. we clean it. It's like, well, right. the probability of that being an appreciable amount of mold is much less as compared to all of your air circulating sure. through visible mold um so what the mold was yeah that's a, a great distinction windows okay uh window sills and also on the wall as well there was uh, a black looking sort of mold on the wall uh, not a huge surface area but it was on the wall um and there's just what wall in the bedroom okay um and that's where most of the mold was in the in the window sill in our bedroom as well oh so it may have been a leak yeah and it was also just really bad windows so it was okay cold okay. outside all right so i think that's that's more um justifiable then if, mm -hmm. it, if it's also in the wall and in the same area that could indicate some sort of you know, leak, and you're also in a fairly humid and damp environment, cold, damp environment, yep. right? Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. 
So, all right, so possible. And These are all the things as a clinician we want to be probing into just to make sure that we have the clearest understanding. It's not that we're, you know, questioning the validity of the story. We just need the details of the story mm -hmm. so we can assign our probability to the finding. Yep, absolutely. And this is where it's important to just not, you know, when you hear something at face value, um, like as you're doing with me right now, it's not just, you know, probe a little bit more into it and question right. it and not have these assumptions. Um, so super important. Um, yep, so move from moved from New York where I was living where the mold was initially exposed, where I was exposed to the mold, moved to Washington State to an apartment, mold in there, moved to another apartment. Also, I think there was mold in there too. I didn't feel any better moving from any of these three places, but it wasn't until right. after I left that apartment for a weekend and I stayed somewhere else, I, that's when I felt much better. And I no supplements, worse eating, um, and yeah, just no food reactivity, right. no brain fog after eating. Um, so yeah, and then I told that to Joe. We did the real-time lab test. There was positive uh, four out of five mold toxins on there. And so we were like, okay, this, this, this seems like this is a, a possible cause. So then I was put on mold binders. So charcoal, chlorella, clay, uh, flax. And what I noticed fairly quickly within maybe a week or two, I saw, oh, wow, my, my bowel movements are, they're like, they're perfect now. They're, they're normal. Um, and I was like, oh, it's working. And, but the, the thing that did not improve was my food reactive brain fog at that time, um, or necessarily my, my fatigue. So really just one symptom was improving. And it was a, a big symptom for me as I'd been dealing with it for a long time. So I was right. really excited about that. And I was sort of assigning the, the cause of that improvement as, oh, we're getting rid of the mold uh, sure. from my urine. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's where we're at this point. What we've been talking about this weekend is, was that related to mold getting better or related to perhaps I just had some bile acid malabsorption and no. Because yeah, it. let's clarify for people. Most of those agents can either help with regularity, mm -hmm. stool form, and or they are bile binders, yep. which if you had some bile acid diarrhea could have been driving that. And mm -hmm. the fact that you responded so quickly to me makes it sound more like it was a GI mediated improvement. Mm. Uh, not necessarily, right? But this is like the devil's advocate question that we should be asking. Right. And, and we, the other thing that would have been expected uh, in theory would be as, because if I was getting rid of the mold from my system, I should have seen improvements in fatigue and brain fog. Sort of, I would expect around the same, you know, time frame of improvement if it was related, if that was the mechanism of improvement. Those things didn't improve. They improved later due to other reasons that we can get into. Um, but yes, yeah, so as we're, I, and just to be very transparent, I I wanted it to be mold because I, I I found an answer, and right. it, it still could have been. We don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. And it very well could have been related to the mold. But I think it's important to question this as well to make sure we don't fall into this you know uh, confirmation bias of oh I had the positive real time lab urine mold test sure. uh, exposure and then I got better on binders. It could be mold, but. I think that's why it's important we're having this conversation just to right. question that assumption. Well, especially if even, we could even argue, okay, let's say you're having a, a short-term GI-mediated improvement in your bowels, um, mm -hmm. but reducing the mold burden through the binders wouldn't have a carryover impact on the fatigue and food reactive brain fog for maybe four weeks or to, at, at the six-week mark. But if that didn't happen mm -hmm. and then something else led to the improvement, then that is more data in the column supporting that it's not mold. Mm -hmm. So am I correct in my understanding that even with further use of the binders up to the four to six week mark, you never saw an improvement in the food reactive brain fog or the fatigue? Or did another variable change? You know, And so is there not a variable reduction that you can say, I only did this for that four to six week? Right. There was other variables. There was you know, doubling down on the limbic retraining. Mm -hmm. um, just recap, uh, just going over again the, the fact that I had fall into this pattern of getting a little bit fearful of, of eating um, right. just because when I, when I was eating, I would, that would lead to brain fog. And so it just, that can lead to worrying about, it led to me worrying about what I was eating. Sure. And so limbic retraining and then also um, doing some adaptogenic herbs. So mm -hmm. things like ashwagandha. Um, so those things were, uh, so those are the two other variables I would say. Right. And so, yeah, it's hard to say if it was for sure the binders, but there were other variables that, you know, for, at that four to six week mark, that I had started those as well. And I- How long was it before you started those other, you know, doubling on the limbic mm -hmm. and the adaptogens? The like adapt how long were you on binders exclusively where that was the only variable changing? 
Roughly. I would at least six weeks, I would say. Ah, of, okay, of, so then we can answer that question. Yeah. So at the six-week mark before you started the other therapies, was the brain fog and food reactive um, fit, or I'm sorry, was the fatigue and food reactive brain fog improving? I, I want to say no because I, I, I noticed that it was more clear. There's a very clear signal once I started uh, okay, the great. adrenal. Okay, so we have support. some signal clarity there then. Okay. Yeah. So the way I interpret all of this is that mold wasn't the primary driver or wasn't the big issue. Mm -hmm. I should be careful to say that at least I've noticed that when I am in an environment where there's mold and I'm, I'm having my characteristic symptoms, which are some fatigue and brain fog, I also notice I have looser bowels. Mm -hmm. But that's something that will change in like a day or so if I'm not in that environment. Um, so that, you know, maybe there was some residual mold or some mold binding helped, but if the environment didn't change, I'm thinking that was more so just supporting your GI, irrespective of if there was a little bit of mold in the mix mm -hmm. or not. But the fact that the other symptoms didn't improve, at least indicates to me and how I interpret this is there was more of a brain-based, you know, limbic issue mm -hmm. present and that you needed to have some hormonal support. Mm -hmm. Right, which we know that the adaptogens help for vigor and vitality and energy. Uh, okay, so what else? You know, as you're going forward in time, what other things are you seeing or observing? Uh, just increased, you know, ability to exercise with feeling, leaving me feeling more energetic than I had in the past. Right, and it's something I wanted to talk about as well as the exercise component. Um, I feel like initially, for maybe the first month or two, I just exercise made me feel more tired if I had just pushed it too far. So if I did one day, felt good, two days, still felt good, th day three, I would feel worse. And so I'd back off. Right. Um, I would say since, uh, yeah, I wanted to go over how I feel like I was able to increase my tolerance of exercise. And, and also now it leads me to feeling even better. And I feel worse when I don't exercise. And you're still um, on binders this entire time? Still on binders. I've been on binders probably since July and it's now January of uh, 2023. Um, so it's it's been a good amount of time. Yeah. And this, so this is something right now I've mentioned on the podcast before. It's, it's an ongoing debate that mainly Joe and I are having. And by debate, I mean this in a very healthy or on the same team perspective where we will play devil's advocate to each other's points. And I'm playing the advocacy point of, I'm not sure mold is as helpful as we think it is, I, I do think there's something there clearly, but I'm, I'm more so suspecting it's around getting people out of environment, mm -hmm. out of the environment, cleaning up any of the sort of psychological wake of that with limbic retraining, mm -hmm. and then maybe help people adapt healthier habits. You know, maybe they've become a little bit reclusive and or reduce exercise, just like your case is yep. portraying. Um, but the testing, I'm still really questioning how accurate the testing is. And we can come back to our conversation from earlier today mm -hmm. if we want just to put that on the board. And the utility of the binders, you know, I'm, I'm looking at them with a pretty close eye as I'm using them with individuals in the clinic. Um, but, you know, in this case, I'm wondering, do you still need to be on binders? And, and a simple experiment you could run is just come off them mm -hmm. and see if your stools regress yeah. quickly. And if they do that, again, that may not mean mold. It may mean you have bile acid malabsorption. Right. Um, but it, it's at least one data point that you could use to help steer this. And then you could maybe just use uh, something like, well, the problem is a lot of the things that are bulking agents for stool consistency are also binders. Mm -hmm. But maybe you try something like psyllium and mm -hmm. just see if just simple psyllium is enough to provide the same benefit. It, again, psyllium binds bile. But it wouldn't be I don't the, think four, right. the four or five things that you're doing. It wouldn't be quite as robust. And that may give you some clarity on you just need some bowel support mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, this toxic burden that needs to be reduced. Yeah. No, that's an experiment I'll try. Um, I will. Yeah, I'll keep you up. I'll keep you posted on that one. I'll, uh, I'll be very methodical with it so we can really isolate the variables and, and make right. sure I know, you know, very clearly what's, what's going on. And to Joe's credit, I'm glad that he pivoted you. Oh, you know, out of the direction of retesting and trying to get your levels down to zero. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because we're all operating under the obvious shared framework of lab testing is one fourth of the data we use to make a decision, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, you know, what would the labs really tell us? 
Yeah, um, which I'm also gonna. I am curious about retesting. So, um, just for the sake of learning and, and more right. informing, uh, just our thought process about this. Not for the sake of steering my treatment, but more for yeah, this is more so as a clinician researcher than it is a patient yes. looking for answers. Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, also, just wanting to uh, re reframe or reword what you had said just about we're just seeking the truth. We don't care about who's right in terms of exactly. it's just we want to figure out what's the truth so we can help our patients just feel better. Yep. Um, but coming back to the exercise piece, um, yeah, I think the two things that I found to be very important in terms of, um, actually, if we want to speak about the reason why do we want to push exercise, um, or we could just talk about... Let's, let, I mean, it all ties together. So, yeah, sure. so, um, yeah, I mean, just there's, there's uh, just the importance of it for improving energy, number one. I mean, that, that's just, there's research on that. There's a recent meta-analysis um, showing just it, it it's able to improve fatigue. Uh, and, and this energy. is in a chronic fatigue cohort, yes. right? Yep. Yeah. So even more important to clarify, mm -hmm. this is in the exact cohort that may proclaim to some extent, I can't exercise. Mm -hmm. right? In the chronic fatigue cohort, meta-analysis data is showing improvements in energy. Yeah. And, and um, yep, so able to improve fatigue and just also its ability to improve mood for sure. And just, uh, yeah, so there's so many benefits to it. And just the, re I think that it's important to, if you feel a little bit worse from it, just doesn't mean to stop. It just means, all right, just pause. And then I would figure out what's the level of exercise you're able to maintain that Gradual doesn't worsen your symptoms. Sure. Sure. Um, and this is the approach they do use in, in chronic fatigue. Yeah. Um, and they also use with athletes, right? Yep. I mean, that's the beauty of it. You know, a lot of the things that we do in a model of disease or illness can also be used for people who are healthy and trying to optimize. Yep, exactly. So just maintaining a level that you can tolerate well. And the, on the uh, parallel to that is also figuring out, I think, being able to expand your diet. So I think those are the people that mm. if you're under eating, if you're restricted, it's going to be harder mm. to increase your intensity because right. you're just not getting enough calories, enough macronutrients. Um, and so figuring out what the underlying cause of your food restrictions are. Is it, um, you know, is it limbic? You need limbic retraining. Is it you have dysbiosis? You need to address that. Um, so figuring that out plus just maintaining a level that works for you and then just slowly pushing those things forward until you're able to expand your diet and just that's what has led at least for me is just ma continuing pushing my exercising and just eating more food and yeah now and I just, an another beautiful thing here also is a additional meta-analysis that was recently published finding that I believe it was obsessive compulsive behavior mm -hmm. is greatly diminished when people exercise. Yep. And so we could definitely make, I think, a fairly safe argument that those who are more sort of worry and limbic prone, whatever label we want to assign, are, are probably also a little bit more obsessive compulsive mm -hmm. about monitoring their symptoms, monitoring their food, potentially worrying about a lab result. So the exercise not only helps with the fatigue, but it, at least in theory, it helps with the worry about their health and their worry about their diet and their ability theoretically to expand their diet. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, these, these healthy behaviors really do tend to be mutually reinforcing. And that's why it's just so important and, and why I'm glad this is coming up yet again, mm -hmm. that we just have to be exercising. And if you're exercising the same amount today as you were three months ago, you need to be doing more. Yep. Now, that being said, it's not just a unidirectional always more. You do want to plan in a week or two where you're going to be doing a lot less. Mm -hmm. and this was actually my last week where I was doing two sets of everything, shorter rides. Um, but the point I'm making is you also have to be progressively pushing your limits and loading more and loading more, then recovering and then ramping back up. Yeah. This is where listening to your body and, and sort of just, how do I feel? Am I just feeling, you know, maybe I'm pushing a little too hard. Now we can, you know, dial it back a bit, but then once you're feeling better, you know, push it back again. And so that's what you recently went through, right? With your, you're about of uh, insomnia and, and <laughs> yeah, and that's a whole other. I had a I had about a ass kicking of four weeks of insomnia, and that's that's something I want to do a podcast unpacking that. But I'm still not fully sure how to attribute cause and effect. Mm -hmm. I think I've figured these things out, but I've learned that whenever I think I know something, wait one or two weeks before, I, or if it's something in the clinic, wait one or two months before mm -hmm. I say, "Ooh, this is really good." I've I've this has been such a gift for me is. The moment I think I have a conclusion, wait. And you know, if it's just me and there's a really tight feedback interval, I wait one or two weeks and I, 
either have affirmation of that conclusion or I go, ooh, you know what? Not so much. If it's in the clinic, because you see patients kind of on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. then I've learned to wait about two months or so before um, sort of sharing my conclusions here on the podcast, because there have been times where I've shared a conclusion that was not quite fully mm. uh, baked yet, so to speak. Sure. Um, so more to follow on that. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, and just something else on the exercise component. I, we talked about this in the car also. Um, so I'm a father of a 10-month-old daughter. And um, I just so want to... A, a human or a... a, <laughs> she's a if, human. if it's a shih tzu, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have a, I have a baby dog and a cat and then a human. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> three growing, kids. Growing family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to just talk about how, you know, in the car we were saying, just when it comes to you know, from our day-to-day -day life, we, we only have so much time to fit in our priorities, right? We, we only have so much we can allocate our time to, so many different activities. And, and you know, we both feel, and the research supports that exercise should be one of those things that is a priority to some degree in somebody's, you know, daily or weekly schedule. Right. And before, when I didn't have a kid, I, was, I you know, it's easier to, there's, there's less reasons to not exercise or to do these different things. Right. But now... I have another human to care for, so I can't just put myself first all the time. Uh, she comes first a lot. And just the importance of really figuring out, how, asking yourself, how can I make this a priority? How can I fit this into my day? Not, uh, oh, I hope I find the time today. Right. And so just having... Making it a non-negotiable. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And getting it to the point, um, I'm not sure if this is too far, and let me know if, I, if it's too far, but... You want to get to the point, or at least I've gotten to the point where if I, I, I don't feel as good when I don't do it, and I almost feel not like in a self-deprecating way, but I almost feel a sense of I don't feel right if I if I miss a workout. I just it doesn't it's because it's I identify with I'm somebody who works out now, sure, and so it's become part of my identity, and so therefore I find the time to make it work. And for me, it has to be in the morning. I can't do it in the evening because that's when my wife's home and, and that's, you know, I want to spend time with her and my, and my, my daughter, Madison. Um, can't be in the middle of the day because I, you know, working. Uh, so for me, the best time for me individually is first thing in the morning, you know. So right. asking myself, all right, so if that's the only time I can work out, how do I make that happen? So I, I wake up earlier. I wake up around 5.30 and start working out by about 5.45 a.m. And so I have to get into bed a little bit earlier. So, you know, 9 o'clock is my bedtime. Um, maybe that's lame, but I, I'm in bed by 9 p.m. Um, and I've communicated with my wife. All right, so this is when I'm going to work out. And then and then she works out uh, shortly after that. And so just having these conversations and finding a way to make it happen because you can make it happen. It's just you maybe need to problem solve or just communicate with your, you know, how, yeah. whoever you need to communicate with. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Hopefully it's inspiring and motivating to that you can make this work like, I, I I have a daughter. I you know, maybe maybe I don't have two kids or three kids, but um, well, yeah. I mean, it, I, it, I th yeah. I think the the foundational point you're making is it has to be enough of a priority for you that it's really a non negotiable mm -hmm. because it's very easy to find a reason why you can't do mm -hmm. something, and there will always be something interfering with your ability to do the things that you want to do. And mm -hmm. and I think it's accurate to say you are never going to be able to do all the things that you want to do. Right? There's other things that I want to do, you know, like more travel, more music, more X, Y, Z, whatever, you know, more socialization. Mm -hmm. But there's also, there, there's kind of would like to's and there's have to's. And the have to list is the things that you just, you prioritize and everything else gets pushed out so that you can always do those. And I think exercise is so important that it has to remain in the bucket of have to's. Mm -hmm. And so other things get pushed back, right? Whatever, maybe that's a little bit less time with your wife or a... I, I hesitate to say a little bit more time for sleep, but there's just other things that get deprioritized to allow that short list of have tos mm -hmm. to be able to get done. And with all that exercise does, I don't know how people cannot make it a have to. Now, I'm also someone who inherently enjoys exercise, so it's easy for me to say, but my goodness, it, you know, it helps everything. It helps you be better at everything that you do, better mood, mental clarity, better physical function. You're going to be less prone to deteriorate as you age and there you'll be less of a burden to others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah. And it's great that you're kind of echoing this reminder for people that if you're not making a priority, find a way mm -hmm. and maybe you have to communicate 
with your significant other and find a way to fit that into your day. And that's also, I think, a good team building exercise. Like, hey, how can we work together to make this work? Yep. And then also just finding, it doesn't have to be, uh, you also want it to be somewhat enjoyable, I think is, is helpful if you can find, if there is a type of physical activity that you personally enjoy. So there's that more intrinsic sort of pull to doing that. Right. Um, I found that uh, group fitness has is is very is you know really enjoyable for me to be around other people doing something hard together. So you know maybe it's doing something like that. Um, maybe. The fact that you do that at the senior center is a little bit concerning to me. I think you're probably bolstering <laughs> your ego there a little bit, but they can, can't keep up with me. We can I mean, talk about that <laughs> later, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go to the Y. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. So yeah, just finding a way to make it work for you, and then also there's the. Um, there's also the immediate gratification after exercising where before I sure. get to do it, there, I, there's almost no days when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to work out. It's, it's just forcing myself to get to that point. Right. The, the espresso really calls to me. I make a delicious espresso drink. Um, and then almost without fail, I'm always so happy I worked out. I feel so much better afterwards, way more awake, way more alert. So you don't, it, just because you don't feel like doing something, it doesn't mean that you still shouldn't do it. I mean, maybe that's more reason to do it as we talked well, about. Well, you know, this ties in yesterday. We went for the the ride around the lake. And then when we got back, you know, I said, Scott, how do you feel about doing the run? Because, you know, the protocol is the ride and then the run. And you said, yeah, you know, I'm not really feeling it. My calves are, were cramping a little bit in the ride. And I answered with, yeah, that's no problem. But then the voice in my, set, the voice in my head, sorry, said, that's even more reason to do it. Mm-hmm. And so I paused we did it. and I said, you know what? <laughs> I think it means we should do it. And it was tough. The, the first one was hard. You know, there's 10. So it's a Tabata timer, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for 10 rounds through. The first one was kind of tough. I think you were a little bit faster off the line for the first. The second and third, we were fairly even. The fourth and fifth, you were ahead of me. And I was <laughs> pissed. pissed off. <laughs> um, and then somewhere around seven or eight, we kind of were fairly neck and neck. And then for the final two, I pulled ahead. You lost me. I, I wasn't going to lose to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was also, it was really fun. Yep. And just being able to find that second gear, if you will, uh, it was challenging. It was fun. We also went into it with the, okay, you know what? If you can't go nuts, that's fine. If you're going to go 60% instead of 100, no problem. It's just about doing it. And mm -hmm. there's been so many times when I've been feeling like that, mm -hmm. you know, and I've done it. And then I find I'm like an animal, um, you know, the last three or four. And it's mm -hmm. like, where did that come from? And you feel so good. Yep. And you also get stronger because of that. And the next time you do it, you're even better. And mm -hmm. your energy gets better. And your mitochondrial density gets better if you want to you know, go geeky mm -hmm. on the mechanisms. And you have more brain-derived neurotrophic factor and growth hormone in the short spurt and testosterone, whatever, you know, if you want to go down into the mechanistic weeds. But you are overall better for it physically and psychologically. So yep. you also you know, you want to plan in some recovery and not just go nuts, nuts, nuts every week without any sort of cycling down. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of carry over there. And I've also found this. It might be the end of the day and there's something that's a challenging cognitive task that I have to do. And you get hit with that same, I don't want to do this. And the ability to get better at doing things when you don't want to do mm -hmm. them and being more consistent, I truly feel is a skill that separates people who are moderate from high achievers. Yep, absolutely. Um, and it's a learned skill. Sorry. It's a learned, mm -hmm. it's not something that you just, you have, you have to get better about pushing through that initial inertia. And, and yeah. that's what I think the, the real key is. Yeah. And also yesterday there was a couple times where, uh, Michael pulled ahead on the bike ride. Uh, he would go around the curves couple, much faster. Couple, couple times. <laughs> no, it was one or two. Uh, I mean, to be fair, you know, the, the maneuvering on some of the turns, that's skill base and that, you know, that's not endurance. That's just, you know, you've learned how to take the yep. curve. So I had a huge advantage there. Yep. And so when I, the, when I was close to him, I was, when I was close to you, I was able to keep up with you. But then as you pulled away, I felt myself slowing down. Mm. And the point I'm making here is that this is where I think, and the same thing with the runs yesterday, how powerful it can be to have somebody that you're working out with, mm. somebody that can keep yeah. you accountable. Yeah. Um, I was only going to let you get so far ahead of me on the run. And uh -huh. then, 
once it was about 10 feet, I said, no, like, I can't <laughs> let him go any further. And it was great. Yeah. Yep. So just, you know, maybe if you don't do a group class, just having, have, finding a partner to do, have some, you know, for accountability, for pushing yourself, I, I think there's, and then also the social bonding that you get from that and from doing something hard together. I think that's just the best aspect of working out with somebody. Right. It doesn't have to be all the time, but just finding time maybe on the weekends to do something together with somebody. Love it. Um, yep. Yep. And then lastly, I love your, your uh, motto of just don't do nothing. <laughs> uh, there's days where I'm just like, you know, I think I probably shouldn't push myself today. I at least just go on a long walk. Mm. So is, or, you know, a low, you know, zone two bike ride. So still, that's what's so nice about having both things like weights and then the zone two. Mm -hmm. Cause even if you're not feeling like doing much, doing a zone two cardio workout, it's not that tough. Mm -mm. I mean, we port we portray it as tough because there is a variance within zone two and on some of the exercise sessions where we're going a little harder. Yep. It's like sixty percent zone two and then maybe <laughs> yeah, then you 40 percent. <laughs> but on a day that you're feeling really beat, it could be mostly zone two and maybe even a little bit of zone one. Mm -hmm. yep. But again, it's better than doing nothing. Absolutely. So I i I do a lot more active recovery days. There's I can't think of the last time I just did zero mm. physical activity. Same. Um walking at the very least, um, yeah. or a zone two ride. So just want to encourage people to at least, um, if you don't feel well, it doesn't mean to do nothing. Just find something that you can do at a low level that you're able to keep moving. Right. Love it. Love it. Awesome. You, you also had in your notes that you wanted to talk about a, uh, gut case series. Yeah. Um, definitely. So I'm sorry. I'm just a gut case. Just one like case. A case series. Not a series. Apply to, yeah. That, that's probably a taller order, but yeah, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about this case. Yeah, so it's a uh, so a patient who she was diagnosed with uh, microscopic colitis by you know her pr uh, practitioner, and uh, her, it had been going her on. GI, I'm assuming her GI, yeah. And uh, so having diarrhea 16 times a day on you know up not all the time but you know up and down uh, for the last two years, and so she had been on steroids. Um, she tried a couple different things, um, but so when she came to us, we uh, you know the main, it just seemed like a you know, mainly a GI case, nothing outside of that. And so got her on some, you know, paleo low FODMAP diet, we got her on the probiotics, uh, had her do an elemental reset uh, for a couple of days and we followed up and she was 75% better just after those right. initial recommendations. So, um, and I know we've had a couple of cases where somebody with this, uh, you know, microscopic colitis, they did that pretty similar approach and they got significantly better. Right. Um, so after that, we pivoted to herbal antimicrobials and we just followed up recently in the first three weeks of being on the, the first round of herbals. She said she felt the best that she's felt in years. Like mm -hmm. she felt fantastic. And, but then week four and then week five and six, she was flaring. So she had been flaring, uh, pretty much back to how she was at her baseline. Um, and so back to loose stool all the time. And she was very disappointed in this. We followed up and we were talking through it, just trying to problem solve what was going on. And so when she told me that it was the, the first three weeks, she felt great on the herbals. And then after that, she flared. Um, you know, uh, one interpretation could have been, oh, great, we're killing things. This is mm -hmm. good. You know, we're, we're going to push through this. And, and, but we took a different approach. And so the first thing I want to bring up is that so healing, it doesn't always happen. In Wait, what was the different approach? You had her stop? So we had her stop the herbals, revisit the elemental reset and um, in the low FODMAP diet. So she had expanded her diet from there. So we basically just revisited the things that worked really well to get her to where she was. So we didn't have to add in any novel therapies. We just, just yeah. by listening to her and saying, okay, the first three weeks you did really well, the fourth week and the fifth and sixth, maybe the herbals were just irritating your gut more. And we, you know, we achieved what we needed to achieve. Maybe let's, let's pause those, go back to doing what you were doing in terms of the reset, elemental diet reset, yeah. um, probiotics, Yeah, this is where the, FODMAP. the practicality is so crucially important because like you're alluding to, depending on your philosophy, you could have a whole bunch of theories. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we've killed the hydrogen, but now there's methane, or mm. maybe it's hydrogen sulfide, or maybe it's a biofilm. So we've got to go deeper. We've got to do more. And I don't know how bad this is occurring in the field, but I suspect it's happening to some extent, which is at that inflection point, you go down this path of, more is better and to solve the problem we need to add things new things and then for these people that may be the opposite of what you should do and then they get worse and 
what ends up happening, you know, down the road from this fork on the road on the path that you don't want to be down mm-hmm. is someone starts to get convinced that they're a chronic, complex, complicated case. And mm. what a travesty, right? Whereas yeah. if we just revisited the clues from what worked previously and yep. did those things and went with the more simplified path, then you get better within maybe a month and you don't go down this road where you spend money and have this sort of fusion of a picture of yourself wherein you're a complicated, chronic, mm. complex case. And all the bad things that accompany that, right? The the worry, maybe the restriction of the diet, yep. the reclusion from social activity, the reduction in exercise. So, you know, these things really do compound in either a positive or a negative direction. I know I'm kind of painting these extremes, but I offer them because I know some people are in the throes of being down the road that we hope someone doesn't go down. Mm-hmm. And I think hearing these stories can give people help. Like, man, if there were some things that helped me and then I kept doing more and more and more, now that I'm thinking about it, that does sound like what happened to me. Maybe I'm not actually as complicated as I think. And just with the right approach that's more simplistic, I can realize so much of the benefit that I'm looking to realize, which is why we share over and over and over again, admittedly, how a handful of things work, right? It's rare that we have a case study where it's, we did, you know, one, two, and three, and then we added four, and then we added five and six, then we had to do seven and even eight. And it was only when we got to the eight that the things, it's really, usually in clinical care, it's not that complicated. The, The complexity is in listening to the patient, organizing the information and being able to figure out the small select handful of things that are helpful Mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, piling on more and more and more. Yep. This is why I love our, uh, you know, the dashboard we have and, you know, on our patients charts, we have the things that have worked, what the response has been. And so it's very easy for us to say, oh, no, you actually, these couple things worked really well for you. So, yeah. And that's not easy, right? You know, having, having that data organized, because if, if someone has done four therapies and three diets before you, and then you've done two diets and four therapies over six months with them, it may not be so easy and so obvious to have the ability to see all those things in a mm-hmm. bird's eye view. Very, yep. It sounds simple when we say it. I don't think most patients would expect their doctor to know that, but I'm sure some patients as they're listening to this are saying, yeah, you know, I feel like the first 15 minutes of the console is me just catching my doctor up as to where we are. Mm-hmm. And this is admittedly why I'm often late <laughs> in, in my clinic days anyway, because before I go into a visit, I want to know exactly where we are. And I don't mean just like what they've done the previous visit up until now. I want to know and have a good idea of the whole history and then see their pre-visit form, have an idea of where they are, and then look and cross-reference my therapeutic hierarchy and have a sense for this is what's been done, this is what they just did, this is what we might want to do next based upon this response. Mm-hmm. And then you go into the visit and you don't need to kind of get caught up. You're rather looking for the few clues or cues that tell you, okay, in the therapeutic hierarchy, we really have two or three different options. Which one do we go down mm-hmm. based upon a few key factoids I'm trying to ascertain? Yep. Yep. In this, this case, um, it wasn't until speaking with her in that follow-up that she said, I felt good week one, two, three, like fantastic. That's a huge clue, right? That's mm-hmm. okay. Herbals were the, you know, treating the dysbiosis that was, that was helping. And then it stopped working for her. Mm-hmm. And so just not having to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, and the thing that I, I really like to encourage people with is when they, when they are able, I, I know it's, it, it can be really hard when you are feeling really good, then you go back to, maybe you take a couple steps back, but I love to point out the fact that, Hey, look at how, how well you're able to feel, how well your body is able to get to the certain point and just, just encourage them like, Hey, your body can do what it needs to do. We just need to maybe troubleshoot a couple of things here and so there. Important. And, and just to give them that, like, oh, you're right. I, my body is able to get to this. And we took a couple of steps back, but why wouldn't we be able to get back to the point you were just at, you right. know? So, important. Um, so I love to encourage people on that. Um, and uh, yeah, just, I, I think this is just a great example of, you know, not making things more complicated, going back to things that worked well and, and just keeping things and listening to the patient, right? Listening to their, you know, sort of describing the sequence of events that are, that are relevant. Mm-hmm. And, and so just, uh, yeah, just wanted to share that yeah. for, for people to help. And, you know, w- w- within the um, listening to the patient, there is also sometimes the need to focus and redirect patients. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, I want to mention this just because you will find yourself speaking with 
an individual of this type, you know, every so often. And it's always a delicate balance for me because I never want to feel someone or I never want someone to feel like I'm not listening. But there are some people that tend to vent and not really answer the question that the, like the clinician asks, right? Yep. You ask one thing and they start just uploading into the dialogue all this context. And there's all the context with none of the answer, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes I just need to know, compared to last time we spoke, is your bloating the same? Is it better or is it worse? And what I really need is a yes or no, because if it is yes, then we're not going to do that one option from the three that I mentioned a moment ago in their hierarchy. If it's no, we're going to do the other. Mm -hmm. And sure, if there's a few circumstantial pieces of evidence that are helpful, yes, but oftentimes you'll ask a, a yes or no question. And if uninterrupted or unfocused, someone will speak for five to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's just all this context. And oftentimes they don't even answer your question. And then you say, okay, so does that mean the bloating is generally better or worse? <laughs> um, so I just, I offer this for patients because sometimes anywhere in life, really, it's helpful to collect your thoughts before you answer and try to really answer with sort of a summary or a conclusion and filter because there is such a thing as too much context. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things that I think we do good with our intake is we, we ask a lot of questions that give us data organized and with the appropriate amount of context to be able to use it diagnostically or prognostically. Uh, so just, you know, as a reminder for some patients, sometimes your clinician may have to refocus you and I know it can feel good to vent, but you want to be careful to respect the time of your clinician because their, their primary role, at least in our clinic, if, it's your, if you're a therapist, different story, right? But in our clinic, we're here to solve a problem and a little bit of venting is okay. You know, we're here for you. We're on your side. We want to Absolutely. build you up and encourage you. Yes. But there's also a time limitation that we have. We don't ever cut people off, but you know, we can't be with a person for an hour mm -hmm. and we don't need to. Right. So, we have to have a little bit of focus and, and constraint. So just something for people to keep in mind that if you are someone who's a, a bit verbose, um, you know, consider working on the brevity of your answers. Yep, yep, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, okay. And the other, the final thing here that uh, I see in your notes that I think we should highlight um, is regarding prebiotics. We did do a write-up on this in the future of functional medicine review clinicians newsletter, but I do think it's worthwhile just um, maybe pointing to it. Do you want to, you know, I know you worked on this. Do you yeah. want to kind of give the, the synopsis and I'll do this in a super low tech way, but here is the, uh, <laughs> can you even see it? No, you can't. Oh, you can see it. So this is the PubMed abstract of the systematic review from 2019. Uh, super high tech. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, give us a rundown. Yeah, so that was, um, so basically, and just backing up also just to the practicality of this, um, just to give you that quick, uh, I told you the case study of the, or just the very quick example of the patient that he said, oh, I've had yeah, that. Yeah, let's let, this is, I think this is a, a really salient reminder for people. So yep. please. Uh, so just somebody came in, uh, said, I've been having a couple of these symptoms, but also diarrhea for the last five weeks. And so I asked him, oh, so... This is a different person. Different person. The last yes. one was diarrhea for, was it 16 weeks? Uh, that was like two years on two, and off. Okay. This is a different person. Um, diarrhea for about five weeks. And I'm just kind of asking him, anything happened around that time? And he said, no, nothing I can think of. And then I come down to the different things that he's trying currently, or taking supplement-wise. And the thing I've seen very frequently is uh, people react, people that have digestive symptoms not doing well with prebiotics. And so, oh, when did you start these prebiotics? He said, oh, about five weeks ago. <laughs> and okay, so let's, uh, let's, from now until we speak next week for our, you know, going over the actual plan, let's pause on the uh, prebiotics and let's just see how you do. Because, you know, this is why I love doing supplement holidays, just at least for a week and seeing, do you need this? Do you, is this helping? Is this hurting? Um, and it's, you know, a week. So a week later, he said, yep, I don't have any more diarrhea. So very... Uh, we could have just gone down the path of giving him, you know, treatment after treatment and he still needs some support, but just sometimes we can, uh, what's the phrase you can add by subtracting. So we helped right. him by removing something. So sometimes we don't have to, we don't have to always add something, um, to help somebody, but this ties in with, um, 
you know, people think that, you know, mechanistically prebiotics are good for the gut, right? They feed, feed the bacteria. We want to, we want to feed the good bacteria. So yes, then that mechanistically, that makes sense. Um, but in those with, let's say IBS, um, there's a, it was a 2019 systematic review and meta-analysis that showed compared to placebo, prebiotics do not help those with IBS symptoms. Um, and <laughs> that's actually a different study than I'm referring to. Oh, that's, it is. That's a different one. Um, that one. This is what you linked in your notes, Yeah, Scott. no, I got You're setting me up for failure here. <laughs> I didn't upload the right one. Um, that one shows that, so those with IBS typically have low bifidobacterium. The study that used prebiotics for IBS found that prebiotics actually increased bifidobacterium. So mechanistically, it increased the thing, the bacteria that's low in IBS, but symptomatically, no difference. Yeah, and that's and that's the key thing is that there's no change in symptoms. And it, you know, we've talked about this in the podcast so many a time, but we want to be careful. And I, even way back in, in Healthy Go Healthy You that published, not to say way back, but I mean it was 2018, right? Mm -hmm. And much, if not really all of the advice in there is still very salient and, mm -hmm. and very reliable in the sense that we don't want to try to micromanage the microbiota ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you can point to data showing that people have lower or higher bacterial populations or diversity, but it doesn't mean that the treatments that increase the diversity are going to improve the health of the host. Mm -hmm. And this is really because we don't know if these changes that we're seeing observationally are cause or effect. And, right. and I've argued and continue to argue that they're the effect, they're not the cause. And this mm -hmm. is evidenced by the fact that the prebiotic supplementation will increase bifidobacterium levels and you'll have no change in the symptoms. Yep. And also that in other trials, you see a fairly appreciable adverse event rate with prebiotics. Now, in, you know, important also to say, there are studies that find benefit from prebiotics, mm -hmm. but the effect size is not as large or the consistency of the finding of benefit is not as consistent yep. um, across studies as it is with things like probiotics. Yep, yep. During the review that, I, that we had done, basically we found um, prebiotics like inulin, though, that doesn't seem to help and actually can make symptoms worse. And it depends on the dose. If, you know, I think it's more and than- sorry, we should linger there for one second because yep. every once in a while someone will say, well, there's a small amount of, or they won't say this. They'll say mm. there's inulin in the probiotic. Mm. I can't take it. Well, we're talking about 500 milligrams, which is so infinitesimal, even maybe less than that. Right. And maybe three, three to 500 milligrams, which you're not looking at doses that have been used in tr studies until you get to three to five grams. So right. 10 times as much. And in some trials, they're using 10, 15 even 20 yep. grams. So the dose does matter here, but mm -hmm. if you're taking a prebiotic supplement and just a prebiotic, the pill is nothing but prebiotic, you're going to be getting, you know, usually w w with our Biota Boost product, I believe it's four capsules will give you about three grams. Okay. Um, I might be slightly off, but so, you know, you're, you're looking at maybe 500 if not a thousand milligrams per capsule. And usually when people are taking a prebiotic, they're taking a few capsules. So when people are supplementing with prebiotics, they're usually doing a few grams worth. Yep. This is much different than maybe three to 500 milligrams in a supplement. That's going to be okay for the vast majority of people. It's important to keep that in mind mm -hmm. because you don't want to become like the nutritional label crusader and say, oh my God, chicory root, like I can't have it. If it's something that is or has been shown to help people like a probiotic or an elemental diet. And there's a small amount of something in there that's very different than a like clinically viable dose. And so I just mentioned that because sometimes people are squeamish about something that can help them because they're not looking at the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the dose that's contained mm -hmm. in whatever it is. Yep. Yep. For sure. So dose matters, type of pre prebiotic matters. So it's definitely, uh, to say prebiotics in general um, aren't good, but you're, what you're saying before is that in the studies looking at the ones that do help IBS, it's it's maybe some gas and bloating improves, but that's really about it. There's not a whole, you know, in terms of uh, global improvement in IBS. Um, but the point I'm making... Maybe some regularity, blood sugar decrease. I mean, there are, you know, there sure. are some benefits. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I think what's important is the timing in which you start prebiotics and your treatment plan. So if you're 
we typically do that more end phase. So we start with the you know, probiotics, herbals, and because so the more it seems that the more symptomatic someone is, the more likely the prebiotics will flare them. And this yeah. also fits in with the immune hypothesis, which which I've been trying to champion, which is the more of a kind of hostile relationship is is existing between the immune system and the microbiota, mm -hmm. then feeding the thing that the immune system is attacking is probably not a good idea. So let's get to more of this immune homeostasis, if you will, mm -hmm. and then we can try to feed the colony and hopefully they'll now kind of be more symbiotic than they were combative. Yep. This, uh, your analogy for, I think it's healthy, get healthy, you, the garden analogy, yep. just uh, yep. you have the weeds in the garden. You don't want to just keep feeding the whole garden as a whole. You want to get rid of the weeds and improve the environment and then you can eventually start to feed right. the garden. So that's, right. um, I think, a perfect analogy. But uh, yep, so uh, anything else about prebiotics? I, I think that the main takeaway is that just in, don't don't let mechanism sort of guide your decisions. Use more, uh, um, you know, outcome data, and then also how does your body feel when you consume something? Right. And um, this comes back to really when you're taking something, really try and isolate the variable. Don't take five different new things at one time, and and then you feel better, but or you feel worse, and you don't know what's causing the right. improvement or worsening. Yeah. So. No. I mean, I think this has been a, a great, you know, navigation of the gamut from putting mold under the microscope. Yep. the importance of exercise and also looking into less is more or mm -hmm. addition by subtraction, as you yep. said. I think that was a very nice way of phrasing it. And then just a reminder on prebiotics can be helpful, but because they've received an inordinate amount of press, we have to kind of keep sounding the, uh, I don't want to say the alarm, but kind of just like portraying the other side of the argument which is can be helpful, but let's kind of contextualize and understand how to use this tool and be on the lookout for the fact that this can flare you. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Like, try it, but don't, like this gentleman did, I'm assuming it was inconceivable to him that the prebiotics were functioning as a, as a culprit. Uh, yep, that's a great point. And so if these things are on your radar, you can consider them as being a problem. You know, be careful not to fall into neuroticism, but at least have your eyes open and be able to sort of pick and choose what's helping you and then, you know, filtering out what's not. But yeah, otherwise, Scott, you know, you are doing such amazing work at the clinic. I just want to commend you again for, Thank for you. Um, doing an awesome job, both as a patient uh, with, with, you know, with working with Joe sure. and as a clinician with all the people that you're helping. So just super happy to have you on the team. And uh, thank you for coming out to Austin again and, and hanging yeah. out and uh, sharing your thoughts. Yep. And I'll, I'll be sure to Venmo you for, for saying that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> thank you so much. Great thank to be you, here. Buddy.